Welcome back to the campfire. Let us return to the story of the sleeping princess. Perhaps the oldest version of the story involves a longed for, supernaturally beautiful girl, demigoddess or goddess, associated with nature facing death in the form of a literal underworld, as in the case of Psyche and Persephone, or spiritual journey to the underworld through some death-like state. The dwarf archetypes act as familiars or initiators into the Chthonic world. The fact that a woman is often the cause of the journey to the underworld could potentially be representative of an initiation ritual into womanhood. It is not uncommon for such rituals to involve symbolic or literal danger. Examples include Patongi, the Balinese teeth filing ritual, the sunrise ceremony of the Apache, which involves four days of grueling dancing, where the teenage girls embody changing women, more on her later, and the special tattoos that mark entry into womanhood in Maori and Fulani culture. Fulani women's tattoos, for instance, are seen as a mark of bravery, and the ritual is considered a form of rebirth into adulthood. This could also perhaps be some kind of shamanistic trance. She is freed from death by the sun, like Apollo, and brings forth children, symbolizing the sun, causing the plants to grow after the winter. The season, incidentally, that snow is a part of. The children are nature beings themselves, potentially symbolizing day and night, or life and death, just like their parents. Her conflict with a mother figure and the absence of a father figure could be symbolic of growing up. It is also similar to the Scottish story of Bride and Bera, where Bera, Queen of Winter, is an evil mother-in-law figure to Bride. She keeps her son Angus, the King of Summer, away from his spring wife Bride for half the year, causing fall and winter. But then Angus rescues Bride, bringing spring. This is, of course, very similar to the myth of Persephone. I have actually written my own proto-sleeping princess myth. The story and accompanying artwork will be featured on a new website that I'm launching, but I will also read the story here. The earth was always green, always in bloom, and there was never any change. The sky looked down and saw the earth's rolling hills and blossoming flowers, and he loved her. But the earth wanted a daughter for her own, with skin as white as snow, hair as black as night, and lips as red as pomegranate. The sky touched the face of the earth, and from their union came snow, the most beautiful girl in the world, with skin as white as snow, hair as black as night, and lips as red as pomegranate. Everywhere she stepped, she spread frost. All the animals of the cold loved her, but the earth did not. As long as ice covered the ground, the earth was not the most beautiful. Snow grew to fear the earth and fled into the mountains, bringing the cold with her. She entered a place of eternal night within the mountain where light did not shine. Night was the weaver of dreams, and some of their number came to snow. They gave her refuge, for as long as snow was on the ground, the world slept. The earth withered, and her rage grew deep like the roots of a tree. She found her daughter in the cave of dreams. As long as snow dwelt there, the earth could not touch her. She disguised herself as a leafless bush with one pomegranate left on it. Snow loved pomegranates. She left the cavern, but when she bit into the pomegranate, poison sprouted inside her. When the dreams returned to their cave, they found snow, flush with poison. They showed Snow how to enter the world between life and death, between waking and sleeping, between day and night. Even in her slumber, she was still the most beautiful. In her cave of darkness, surrounded by flowers, she was the jewel of the world. The sun rose over the horizon, and his brightness lit the cave with the vibrance of life, of newness. Snow exited the cave, and the world bloomed as spring came for the first time. She had a baby on each hip, a son, day, and a daughter, night. They are forever babies, because every morn and every twilight, they are newborn. But the son's father time was the thief of day and night. Each dawn and dusk, he would send his wife to take the twins to him so that he could consume them. And each dawn and dusk, she would present him the flesh of a lamb. In this way, day and night came to the world. For half of the rolling year, snow is the spring mother, bringing forth blooming plants, then, as the nights grow longer, chasing away the sun, she ages backward into the womb of winter and becomes the winter maiden before awakening by the light of the sun and causing spring. Let me break down where I got each story element from. The Earth Mother and Sky Father come from the Greek Demeter and Zeus, who are Persephone's parents. Plus, they just make sense as the parents of the embodiment of the seasons. The Sky Father and Earth Mother are also in a union in Proto-Indo-European mythology, 
which predates Greek religion and influenced it. Snow's name comes from Kyanie, but is also inspired by the Irish Kayak, who becomes a young woman at the end of winter and then ages through the year, becoming old when winter comes. I envision Snow as a goddess of the seasons. Her description, skin as white as snow, hair as black as night, and lips as red as pomegranate, is drawn from many of the type 709 tales I discussed in part one. Another relevant thing about the pomegranate, aside from the Persephone reference, is that pomegranates originate in the Middle East, where civilization began, and where the oldest sleeping princess story was likely told. The distribution of stories that feature pomegranates is spread across the Mediterranean, and changes to other fruits slash objects as you go further north. The mention of animals loving her is inspired by Grimm's telling, but it also fits Snow as a nature goddess. She goes to a mountain cave for a number of reasons. Mountains and caves appear in a number of these stories, and dwarves and the Fae are associated with caves. Caves are also liminal spaces, open to the world, but going into the earth like a grave. I took the term the Weaver of Dreams for the night directly from Norse myth. Earth disguising herself as a leafless bush is my version of the old crone disguise. Snow's cave burial with flowers shows her dichotomy as both winter and spring. Also, the world's oldest known burial site is in a cave. Another extremely old burial site is a cave decorated with flowers in Israel. Ancient cave art has been potentially linked to shamanism as well. The sun awakening snow is drawn partly from Kyanie and Apollo, but also draws heavily from sun, moon, and Talia. Talia is a symbol of fertility. Unlike the barren queen, she is able to bear and nurse children in her sleep. Similarly, snow is thawed by the life-giving rays of the sun and produces not only the growing plants, but also two children, day and night, who are inspired by other pairs of twins I mentioned in this series. Twins appear in mythology worldwide and are a part of the world's oldest myths. The union of the sun god and the night goddess coated snow is also similar to the sun and moon couples in mythology, such as the Mayan moon goddess Ishel and the sun god Kenicha Hau, the Tupi moon mother goddess Jaycee and the sun creator god Garachi, and the Chinese moon goddess Chang'e and the solar archer Hoyi. Ishel even has a resurrection from death, like Snow White. Time's cannibalism switch is obviously inspired by the fairy tales where this happens, but also by Cronus and Rhea. I decided to have Time send his wife to nod to all the stories where the mother-in-law tries to consume her grandchildren. Snow's yearly transformation from maiden to mother is inspired by the Kayak Persephone, the Sumerian fertility goddess Inanna, who descends into and escapes from the underworld, and the Navajo changing woman, who transforms with the season and bears the twin children of the sun after he shines his rays on her, as well as many other mythological figures of this archetype. Inanna slash Ishtar should have been mentioned in part one. Not only does she go into and leave the underworld, but her death is caused by an older female relative. In this case, the death goddess Erishkadal. She also has two sons, Shara and Lulau. At the end of the story, her husband, Demuzi, has to spend half the year in the underworld in a sort of gender-reversed Persephone and Hades. I also want to explain the historical influences on the artwork. Sky is inspired by the Rigvedic god Deus and the Sumerian god Anu. Both are extremely ancient sky father gods from the Middle East. Deus is sometimes represented as a black stallion studded with pearls, so I gave Sky night black skin and put pearls in his headdress. He has oryx horns and a crown, which is inspired by the symbol of Anu, and his curly hair and beard is an ancient hairstyle from the Fertile Crescent. I specifically took influence from the stella of Shamsi Adad V, which is dated between 815 and 811 BC. Earth has green skin like Gaius's consort Prithvi. Her name means the vast one, which is similar to the Proto-Indo-European Earth Goddess, who is an epithet meaning the broad one. I was inspired by this and by Venus figures to make Earth a very large round woman. Her curly hair and bangs come from a statue of the Middle Eastern goddess Asherah. Now it is unclear in all these stories whether or not Snow White has supernaturally white skin or simply a skin that is pale for a person of her ethnicity who has not worked outside. Pale skin has been a sign of beauty across ethnic groups because it means that the person is rich enough not to do outdoor labor. Super problematic, but my point in mentioning all this is that the character isn't necessarily white, as in European. Snow in my story has supernaturally white skin, which makes sense given that her parents have unnatural skin tones as well. She of course has night black hair and pomegranate red lips, but her hairstyle, jewelry, and dress are inspired by a Babylonian terracotta relief of Ishtar, the ancient Mesopotamian goddess of love, war, and fertility, an Akkadian cylinder seal impression possibly depicting Nin Hersag, the ancient Sumerian mother goddess of the mountains, and a reconstructed colorized lady of Oxer from 7th century BC Greece, which is perhaps a representation of Persephone. 
I was also inspired by descriptions of the Vedic dawn goddess Ushas, who is Deus' daughter. She is a beautiful maiden covered in jewels. She is surrounded by snowflakes that are also stars, representing her connections to winter and the night. I arranged it in a similar way to the votive Stella of the Mesopotamian goddess of healing. One of the trickiest things to depict were the dream spirits. Their cave has handprints and cattle, which are super common in prehistoric cave art. The dream spirits themselves are black-skinned, like the dark elves or dwarves of Norse myth, and they are weaving dreams out of flax on a loom. I chose flax because of Sleeping Beauty. Interestingly, some of the oldest fabric weaving was made with flax in Egypt. I've already talked about Snow's cave, but the sun's entrance into the cave with the rising sun comes from descriptions of the Vedic sun god Surya. His solar crown comes straight from an early 4th century BC relief of the Greek sun god Helios. He has tight, curly hair like a Sumerian god. See Mesopotamian sun god Shamus on screen. He wears a kilt pattern with the solar star of Shamus. On screen is some of the Sumerian art that inspired his clothing and hairstyle. Baby Day glows with golden skin like his father, and Baby Night has the black skin of her grandfather's sky and the dream spirits. Instead of stars and snowflakes, Snow is surrounded with flower suns. Now a mother, Snow's body is more like her mother's. She wears a floral sun headdress that is very loosely reimagined from this Hittite goddess and child statue, this seated goddess statue possibly of Persephone on her underworld throne, and this statue of Isis and Horus. I hope you liked hearing about the ancient art research that went into these illustrations. I had a blast creating this. Up next is Rapunzel, the sun goddess in the tower. Is snow, sun, day, and night a real myth? Absolutely not. But does it have pieces of stories that we've been telling ourselves for thousands of years? Yes. I'm sure we'll continue to reinvent these ancient stories forever.